Welcome to the services of 3rd Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. We are located in the heart of South Dallas at 2408 Hatcher Street, Dallas, Texas, which is two blocks east of Highway 175. Michael D. Pryor is the pastor. All are welcome to worship with us in any and all of our regular scheduled worship services, beginning Sunday at 9.15 a.m. Sunday School, 10.30 a.m. Morning Worship, and 5 o'clock p.m. Evening Worship, Wednesday, Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. and midweek prayer service at 8 o'clock p.m. The motto of this broadcast is Passing on the Torch, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We hope you will find a blessing in today's message. On today, I'd like to call your attention to Ephesians chapter 4, and I'd like to read in your hearing from verses 7 through verses 16, which deals with the practice of believers in relation to spiritual gifts. Well, these verses deal with this topic. But I like to read these verses which says, But unto every one of us is given grace, uh -huh. according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Well, now that he, he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended well, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers uh -huh. for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, well, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, uh -huh. and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up un into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply it, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Uh -huh. From these words, I'd like to talk to you from this subject, growth in the body of Christ both in size and in spirituality. Well, Let me say it again. Growth in the body of Christ, both in size and in spirituality. Amen. That's what I want to talk about. And I want you to, first of all, think about these words. Because in this passage of Scripture, written by the Apostle Paul, which begins the second half of the epistle to the Ephesians, which emphasizes the Christian's walk, uh -huh. first having expressed in verses 1 through 6 of Ephesians that believers are one in body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, and God. Well. Now, in verses 7, through 16 in the practical section of this epistle, Paul deal with the daily walk of God's new people. Amen. He deals with this because the Christian life starts with one step of faith, and it involves progress, and it also demands balance and strength. Because just as a young child learning to walk, the Christian life is compared to a walk because Christians are to walk even as Jesus walked. Amen. That is, we are to walk worthy well. of the vocation wherewith ye are called, Amen. which means we are to live in a way uh -huh. that is in harmony with that holy calling. Amen. Because if we do not learn to walk, we will never be able to run Amen. or stand in battle. 
And one thing essential to a worthy Christian walk is an earnest effort to promote the unity of the spirit, which always recognize the diversity of its members. And I tell you that because each member of the body of Christ has a particular role assigned. And no two members are alike. And no two have exactly the same function. Instead, Ephesians 4 and 7 shows the part to be played by each member of the body of Christ is assigned according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That is, Jesus Christ does it as he sees fit, which actually means God has given to each child of his grace in which to grow uh -huh. and the ability to exercise that gift for the purpose of building up the body of Christ because spiritual gifts are given Amen. to profit the church. Notice I said to profit the church Amen. because no gift is to be used selfishly well. for personal profit. Amen. In fact, it is not a spiritual gift if it is being used that way uh -huh. because a gift is given to every member of the body of Christ Amen. to enable the believer to function for a very definite reason in his position in the body uh -huh. and thereby produce harmony within the body of Christ. Otherwise, the whole body of Christ suffers yeah. When you don't exercise your gift in the body, Amen. then the body gets out of tune. But on the other hand, as each member fulfills his appointed work, uh -huh. the body of Christ grows both spiritually and numerically. So let me just pause here for a moment. And I want to remind you about four things right. about spiritual gifts. First, Verse 7, clearly teach every Christian has a gift of some kind Amen. because a gift of grace is said to be unto every one of us. Amen. And what you need to know is each has a capacity for service uh -huh. somewhere within the body of Christ. Amen. Whether others consider it important or not, God deems it so. Therefore, don't look down on the gift God has given you. Nor should you take the attitude that there is nothing that I can do in the church. Because second, there is a wide diversity in these gifts, which is also pointed out in Ephesians 4 and 7. And each believer possesses an individuality that God recognizes and use in his service. So third, let's not forget that the special grace which each believer possess well, is bestowed according to the measure of the gift of Christ, uh -huh. the exalted sovereign Lord, which rules out our merit. Uh -huh. It rules out our own previous capacity, Amen. even our asking but it is to his own good pleasure uh -huh. that God has given you a gift Amen. to glorify him. Yeah. But last of all, in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 4, as we look ahead, notice with me that Paul quotes Psalm 68 and 18 uh -huh. to picture the ascended Messiah triumph over Satan and his host distributing spiritual gifts to his people. In other words, wherefore, he meaning God, saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That is, the imagery is that of a military conqueror leading captives in triumph and laden with spoils, which he distributes to his followers which is what Jesus did when he left heaven's glory and came down here on earth and lived, first of all, he was born of a virgin and he lived a sinless life 
and he died a substitutionary death. And most of all, he rose from the grave for our justification. In other words, Jesus won the victory of sin, Satan, death, and the grave. And when he ascended back to heaven, according to Ephesians 4, verse 7 and 8, he gave gifts to the church. Gifts for unity in the church and gifts to his people through the coming of the Holy Spirit. In verse 11, you will also see that he gave gifted men to the local assemblies as well. But before I speak on that in verse 11, let me say in verse 9 and 10, these verses are inserted parenthetically to explain verse 8 and to show that the passage quoted refers to Jesus Christ coming to our humble planet as a man in his incarnation and dying on the cross for our sins in his humiliation and descent. And now that he ascended uh -huh. and is seated at the right hand of his father in glory, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above uh -huh. all heavens. Well, in other words, Jesus Christ is Lord of the whole universe, Amen. past, present, uh -huh. and future. And he fills all things in the sense that he is the source of all blessing, the sum of all virtues, and supreme sovereign over all, because he is the giver of the gifts, who ascended back to heaven as our mighty conquering king, who said to a dying thief today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I want you to know that paradise it's where Jesus is. And Jesus is in heaven uh -huh. with God the Father. Because to be absent from the body yes, is to be present well. with the Lord. Amen. That is Christ led captivity captive, uh -huh. which I believe refers to the redeemed of the Old Testament uh -huh. who went to paradise when they died, which was once in the heart of the earth. Amen. But now it is in heaven. Uh -huh. Therefore, every believer when he or she dies well. is in the very presence of God. Amen. And those who are alive and remain on earth, uh -huh. when Christ ascended, he also gave gifts to men. Amen. Or he conferred gifts upon living believers in the church well. so that they might witness to the world. And now in verses 11 and 12 of Ephesians 4, the giver of the gifts, the ascended Lord and Savior, uh -huh. Jesus Christ, the head and owner of the church, well. who does not want our oneness in Christ to destroy our individuality. To our surprise, we learn the gifts are not just the Spirit of God doing something through the believer for the purpose of building up the body of believers. Well, but the gifts are men too. Amen. I want you to see that in verse 11. See, the gifts are not just the Spirit of God doing something through the believer uh -huh. for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. But Ephesians 4 and 11 shows us that the gifts are men too. Amen. That is men uh -huh. who are given to strengthen and encourage Amen. the church. Amen. And the names of the gifts or the men who fulfill the office uh -huh. are now given, such as Christ himself gave some yeah. as apostles well. who were men directly commissioned by the Lord to preach the word uh -huh. and to plant churches. Amen. And their qualifications were in Acts, 1 and 22. Well. And their abilities are described in 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. Uh -huh. And their message confirmed in Hebrews 2 and 4. Amen. And together with the New Testament prophets, their ministry was primarily concerned with the foundation of the church. Amen. 
according to Ephesians 2 and 20. Amen. In other words, these eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection were commissioned by him to preach the gospel. Amen. And they enjoyed a special inspiration, which by virtue of their office, apostles and New Testament prophets today, their office has ceased. Uh -huh. Next of all, notice in Ephesians 4 and 11. He gave some as prophets. In other words, New Testament prophets who were spokesmen or mouthpieces of God who received direct revelations from the Lord and passed them on to the church. And what they spoke by the Holy Spirit was the word of God as men given particular insight into the doctrines. Uh -huh. In other words, like the apostles, the New Testament prophets' ministry was ended yeah. when the foundation of the church was laid Amen. and when the New Testament canon was completed. Uh -huh. However, they are still a part of that great cloud of witnesses today yeah. in heaven. Well. And God speak to us through them by the inspired scriptures which they wrote well, unto us. Uh -huh. So now he gave some as evangelists Amen. who are those who preach the good news of salvation, but not necessarily as we think of an evangelist well, today who come to an established church uh -huh. where people are already congregating and saved. Well, and doing the work of God. Uh -huh. See that's the way most of us think of an evangelist. Uh -huh. Instead evangelists were traveling missionaries. Uh -huh. Who went to the lost. Without the support or the help of a committee. Uh -huh. Or organization to set up a campaign. In other words they trusted in God. Uh -huh. As they went out alone to preach the gospel. Yeah. To the lost with clear perceptions of saving truth. And they possessed an unusual power in recommending it to others. Right. Finally, notice in Ephesians 4 and 11, Jesus Christ, yeah. the risen head of the church, well. who has purchased it with his own shed blood, Amen. he gave some men as pastors yes. and teachers, well. which is one office, uh -huh. pastor-teacher, right. with a dual function combined in one person well, whose function is to shepherd the flock of God uh -huh. and to instruct them in divine truth yeah. because the pastor teachers serve as an under shepherd uh -huh. of the sheep of Christ well, who guide and feed the flock uh -huh. and gives wise counsel, correction, right. encouragement, uh -huh. and consolation to the sheep Amen. through the word of God. In other words, unlike evangelists, which go from place to place and lead new converts to a local church where they will be fed and encouraged, the pastor teacher has a settled ministry, especially in showing the members of the church how each passage of scripture fits into the context. That's why before looking at verse 12, let me say a final word about verse 11. Uh -huh. We should be careful to, to distinguish between divine gifts and natural talents. I want you to really, really think about that as you look at verse 11. We should be careful to distinguish between divine gifts and natural talents because no unsaved person or Christian for that matter However talented could be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, or pastor teacher in the New Testament sense unless he be called and equipped by God because the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural and Christ enable men to do what otherwise would be humanly impossible for men to do. That's why now in Ephesians 4 and 12 and verse 13 too, we come to the function 
or the purpose of the gifts. Because God has given his church an enormous responsibility. In Matthew 28, in verse 18 through 20, to make disciples in every nation. And this process involves preaching, teaching, healing, nurturing, giving, administrating, building, and many other tasks as well. And no one individual can do it all. But notice God calls us as members of his body to fulfill the task together in obedience to the word of God. However, we have a sinful, sinful tendency today either to overestimate what we can do alone or to underestimate what we can do as a body rather than functioning together as those called out by God. But let us observe what the Bible says. These spiritually gifted men in verse 11 were given to the church in verse 12 for three reasons. First, for the perfecting of the saints. That is, the gifts equip the saints. The gifted men equip the saints. Second, for the work of the ministry. That is, the saints then serve. And third, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is, the body is then built up. In other words, let me go and break it down to you. Where the rubber meets the road. Because I'm doing just as much teaching in this sermon than I, than I am preaching. I want you to realize that the ultimate goal of growth is explained in verses 13 through 16. And what Paul had in mind when he spoke of the building up of the body of Christ wasn't just the numerical growth of the church, but the attainment of spiritual maturity. Henceforth, notice the goal defined in verses 13 through 16 by four words. These four words are till, come, in, and unto. I don't have time to go through it in this message, but I want you to think about these four words and underline them and mark them, put them, highlight them, whatever you're doing. Whether you are using your iPad, whether you are marking it in your Bible, you ought to note these four words, till, come, in, and unto. Because God has given the spiritual gifted men to the church that it might be brought into full maturity. That is, notice God wants us to grow up, get off the bottle, get on some meat. That's why in verse 12, Paul made it clear that the ministry is not a specialized occupation limited to men with professional training. But ministry simply means service. And it includes every form of spiritual service. Also notice every believer should be in the ministry. Not preaching in the pulpit as a hired staff member in full-time Christian work. Being observed by the members in the pew who watch him do the ministry. And that's the way most people look at the preacher. Then we hire him. Didn't we call him? Isn't he supposed to be doing the ministry? No, he is to be teaching you, preparing you, equipping you to do the ministry. Instead, what you ought to know is every Christian should be in full-time Christian service because the work of service is done by the saints. And it is the task of the pastor teacher to equip them for this service. Because according to verse 7, each believer has received a gift of grace. Each believer has received a certain capacity for service. So no one should make any excuse for their lack of service. Because every believer has a contribution to make to the edifying or to the building up 
of the body of Christ. And if the church is not growing, it's not the preacher's fault. I assure you that. If the church is not increasing in number, if the church is not increasing in finances, and if the church is not increasing in spirituality, it's because of the fact that the members are not doing the work of the ministry. Therefore, the pastor teacher's role is not to make people perpetually dependent on him. In other words, if I should die tomorrow, don't you sit here mourning for me? Waiting on a 30-day period before you choose another pastor? There are qualified persons already recommended and should be appointed to continue on with that work. Therefore, again, the pastor's role is not to make people perpetually dependent on him. Instead, his goal should be to see the day when the saints will be able to carry on by themselves. In other words, when they go out and win the loss to Christ. Because we have all received gifts that we can use in helping to fulfill the great commission. But the limitation of Christian service to a select class of men hinders the development of God's people both in size and spirituality as well as it stifles the cause of world evangelism. And most of all, it stunts the growth of the church because we're so dependent on one man to do it all. We're so limited in our mind of thinking that that's what he's supposed to be doing. Well, well the truth of the matter is I'm doing right now what I'm supposed to be doing. But are you receiving God's word? If I ask you, if I ask you, if I ask any one of you, can you teach the Bible class? You ought to say, I have been here. I have been studying. I have been paying attention. I have received the word and any assignment. We never given. like to end our broadcast without offering our viewers the plan of salvation. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Will you make this confession today? Thank you for watching the Third Avenue Missionary Baptist Church broadcast. For more information about this message, you may call us at 214-428-3695 or 214-428-4250 or write us at 2408 Hatcher Street, Dallas, Texas 75215. We invite you to attend any and all of our scheduled church services. Join us again each week on this station.